Good morning. I'm Jose Diaz Miron with uh, Children's Hospital Colorado. I'm one of the pediatric surgeons here at the institution. And I'm Dr. David Partrick, also one of the pediatric surgeons uh, at the Children's Hospital Colorado. We are going to be talking about pectus excavatum, which is a relatively common thing we see here, a chest wall abnormality in children. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, presentation of these patients, how we treat them surgically, and how we manage them postoperatively. So Dave, when, when don't we start talking about the typical presentation for these kids? So pectus excavatum typically occurs in approximately one out of a thousand children. It's much more common in males than females. Um, also tends to be more common in kids who are relatively tall and thin. Um, in a small number of patients, there's connective tissue disorders or other things associated with it, but with the overwhelming number of patients, it's, a, it's an isolated problem without any other uh, associated abnormalities. What's your, your typical evaluation for a patient when you see them in clinic? So seeing these patients in clinic, we try to evaluate how much this, this depression in, in the chest, and that's what the pectus excavatum is, is a, is a depression uh, usually involving the lower, lower half or lower two-thirds or so of the sternum, but evaluating how much this is affecting them, um, mostly from a functional standpoint where uh, many of these patients, as this gets deeper with growth, they will often have exercise intolerance, breathing difficulties with exercise, um, needing to take more frequent rests, um, and they notice that they can't keep up with their peers or their, or their siblings and having more difficulty, uh, often dropping out of sports and other things like that. And then there's other, you know, psychosocial aspects to it that come from the, just the cosmetic appearance of this, you know, what can be a quite severe uh, depression in the chest. Um, our workup starts with, um, first of all, a physical examination, just kind of documenting the severity of it. We then will often get um, a very limited CAT scan or CT scan right through this area. Um, again, uh, quantifying the severity of the sternal depression, as well as looking at the underlying anatomy in terms of how this is affecting the heart and the lungs. Uh, and then we'll often do an echocardiogram to look at the heart itself, as well as getting uh, pulmonary function tests and exercise uh, tolerance tests to see again how it's a function affecting them functionally. How do you counsel a patient that comes to see you in clinic that wants an operation? So the first decision is really, um, you know, if the, the, the pectus excavatum is severe enough to justify doing an operation, um, and having a very, you, you know, this is not a life-threatening problem, so I have a very detailed discussion with the family as well as the patient, um, trying to again determine how much this is bothering them and is it bothering them enough to go through an operation to correct it. Um, so it's very much of an individual decision in terms of, of how much this is affecting them, um, again from an activity level or from a, from a psychosocial aspect. When a patient and their family decides that they want to proceed with surgery, what options do you give them? For most patients, and again, it's going to be variable, but we would typically say, um, timing-wise, the optimal age to do this type of surgical correction is between 12 to 16 years old or so. And there, there's occasional times we'll, we'll recommend surgery younger than that, and there's certainly times we'll do it older than that as well. But somewhere in that kind of, you know, late adolescent, early, early teen uh, years. And this, the, there's, a, there's an open surgery that potentially can be involved with this. That's a less common thing that we do. Most patients are, are good candidates for this thoracoscopic assisted um, nuss bar placement. And that's where it's a minimally invasive procedure where we make a little one inch incision or so on each side of the chest and we put a bar, it's actually a metal bar that goes across right behind the sternum it's a, it's a C-shaped bar, then we then, we then rotate into position. When that's rota rotated into position intraoperatively, it, that bar actually pushes the whole sternum out. So the sternum gets pushed out into a, a more neutral or a more normal position. 
and then that bar typically stays in for a period of two to four years, depending on their growth and how, how they're tolerating things. Um, but it basically acts like an internal brace. That bar is going to hold the sternum in the place where we want it to be. And over that two to four year period, all the cartilage and everything here in front of the chest all gets replaced. So when we come back and take the bar out two to four years later, everything stays right there. So it really is a two-stage procedure. It's the initial bar placement, which is the more um, uh, intensive part of the procedure, and then the second procedure, removing the bar two or four years later, that's an outpatient procedure that's much more straightforward. And what do you tell the, the patient that they should expect after the procedure? So after the procedure, I, I do tell them, even though it's a minimally invasive procedure with small incisions, it's still quite uncomfortable afterwards. And so a lot of the post-operative management really revolves around um, working with the pain control for the first few days and even first few weeks, and then, you know, talking about certain activity restrictions that are, that are involved for the first few weeks, the first few months as well. So after the surgery, as I was talking about, uh, the, the pain management is really something that we've, we've tried to really fine tune over the years and improve, really. Um, uh, Pepe, maybe I can ask you what options are there now and what are we doing in terms of pain management for these patients postoperatively? That's an excellent question. Uh, it's uh, a question that continues to evolve. Uh, we used to use epidurals in the majority of these patients. Uh, epidurals are becoming less common uh, in the repair of pectus escalatum, and we're trying to focus more on um, pain control modalities that hopefully minimizes the usage of narcotic pain medicines after the operation. And interestingly, we are uh, currently running a randomized control trial here at Children's Colorado that uh, looks at the three most common pain control modalities that we use at the hospital. These include a PCA or a pain mutton, uh, an erector spinae block, or two catheters that are placed under ultrasound by our anesthesia colleagues once the patient is already asleep. Those infuse uh, local numbing medicine that provide pain control to the entire chest after the operation. And the third one is something called intercostal nerve cryoablation. This is an adjunct to the procedure that we're already performing. When we are already inside of the chest and looking at everything thoracoscopically, we use a commercially designed probe that freezes um, nerves on both sides of the chest so that they provide continuous numbing sensation for several weeks after the operation. And this trial is looking at the, these three pain control modalities and uh, comparing them to each other in a, in a randomized fashion. So the patient doesn't know which procedure they would be getting and we don't know which procedure they will be getting until we actually get into the operating room. So what are the risks and benefits with each of these three modalities? So we have uh, the, the pain button, the pain control button, that provides a narcotic pain medicine that's in, into the IV. So that can lead to over-sedation. We can also have issues with inadequate pain control or pain, uh, pain pump malfunction. Uh, the erector spinae block, you can have a theoretical chance of an infection because those are catheters that are being placed under the skin. This is very rare. Um, and other uh, issues that can arise with that is also inadequate pain control and malfunction of the, the pump that infuses the local numbing medicine. And then for the intercostal uh, nerve cryoablation, you can have postoperative nerve pain. This is very rare in the pediatric population and you can have uh, numbness that extends over four months uh, after the procedure. Again, this is also very rare after the, the operation. And so uh, those pain management strategies are there during the hospital stay, which is usually two to three, sometimes four days in the hospital. What, what can patients expect once they get discharged home then in terms of pain control, but also in terms of uh, activity restrictions, things like that? So a patient will be discharged from the hospital once they are tolerating a regular diet. They have pain control that is ex exclusive with oral medicines, and they've passed a physical therapy evaluation. After they meet all of these uh, uh, di discharge criteria, then they go home and um, they should expect uh, activity restrictions for the first three months after the operation. 
and we will follow patients in a combination between uh, clinic as well as uh, uh, phone call checkups that will focus on post-operative pain control and how well they're doing overall. And then so patients can expect to be back to some activities within three or four weeks after the surgery. When do you tell them that they can be back to full activity, heavy lifting, contact sports, those kind of things? After three months. Three months. Three months. So after three months, patients can be back to full activity, and that's really independent of whatever, whatever pain control modality they use after the surgery. Correct. So everyone has the same activity restrictions regardless of the pain control modality that they had intraoperatively. Uh, but uh, at the three-month mark, all the activity restrictions are lifted. And then the bar stays in, as we talked about earlier, two to four years. Um, and then gets removed as just an outpatient procedure. And what's the, what's the long-term efficacy of this procedure in terms of recurrence problems? It, it's, a, it's a very good procedure. It, it provides a very good cosmetic outcome. But as you talked about, you know, if you take it out too early, then you have the probability of a recurrence, especially if the patient is still growing. If, they're, if they have another growth spurt, then there's a, a likelihood that the pectus excavatum could uh, redevelop. It's not very common, and that's why we, we try to minimize this risk by extending the amount of time that the patient actually has the bar in place. Yeah, and I'll often tell families that we, we like to delay removing the bar until they're beyond most of their growth, because a lot of that recurrence risk will sometimes also correlate with if they go through a big growth spurt. So hopefully by the time we take the bar out, most patients are beyond most of their growth at that point. So in general, what we know from a, a large experience over many years with this procedure is that, family, is that patients recover um, very well after dealing with some initial pain control issues right after the surgery um, and, and get back to activity relatively quickly, often quicker than they think they're going to, and uh, are very happy and satisfied their, with the results afterwards. Thank you for joining us today. I hope this information has been helpful. If you have any further questions, please call our clinic or visit our website.